There you go. Something is, is something is doing uh, some heavy breathing in the background. Yeah, I there. think the phone. If you maybe you could mute that. Oh, it might be the my fan though. Let me turn my uh, fan. It might, be, it might be Meryl's. Uh, she's driving. So um, okay. So hello everybody. We're gonna if I remember. We're gonna have to stop like a little, a minute or so early uh, because at 7.30, uh, we have a Zoom Shiva minion for uh, Jerry Bloom and his family. So uh, we'll have to cut off what, you know, whatever we're doing. Um, I wanna do that uh, a minute or so before, whatever, 7.29. The Torah portion for this Shabbos is Emor or Emor. Um, it begins in our It's Chaim Chumash on 717, 717. It's chapter 21 in Leviticus, and it goes through chapter 24 completely. So 21, 22, 23, 24. Um, and it's a little bit of a, of a bifurcated um, or trifurcated um Torah portion. The first part of it is very much focused on the priests themselves and giving them some um, very specific instructions about how they are supposed to live their daily lives, specifically, you know, following up on the Shmuz, specifically about personal matters, mourning, wedding, getting who you marry, things like that. Um, physical uh, uh, qualifications and disqualifications. I wrote about that a little bit in the Torah Sparks uh, that went out today. Um, <coughs> and uh, then we have, so we have um, purity and impurity rules having to do with them and so on. And then um, in chapter, um, Um, in chapter 22, we sort of move a little bit into from the priests themselves to the idea that, and guess what? If you're not a priest, mind your own business and keep out of what the priests are supposed to be doing. The stuff that the priests do is for the priests and for the priests alone. So if you're a czar, if you're an outsider, just don't try to do the stuff that priests do. Don't, don't try to take the, enjoy the benefits that the priests have. Um, and then right uh, at uh, verse 26 in chapter 22, um, we have this a little bit of a turning point and that actually becomes the beginning of holiday Torah readings. And it starts talking about general rule, a general rule for all of the children of Israel who may wanna bring offerings to the temple and how they, what's, what's an eligible offering for them. And then we have um, a very uh, uh, short, but uh, uh, key warning um, that deals with uh, the concept of Chilul Hashem, which uh, desecrating God's name. And we, all of us, not just the priests, are uh, 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 charged to not defile, desecrate God's name, not to cause a Chilul Hashem, not to make a Chilul Hashem. Then chapter 23 is the reason that we read this on, on the festivals is this is the festival calendar. Um, and it starts with uh, um, Shabbat. And then it goes through uh, the first festival of the year is, what's the first festival of the year? Pesach, right? And then it talks about Svirata Omer, what we're in the middle of doing right now. And not then... Not, like Bomer. not yet. You're ruining the, the, the count. You're going to get everybody all confused. But tonight's when you do the bonfires because you can't do it tomorrow night. Right. That's what we're going to have. We're going to have like a virtual bonfire, just like like on, you know, in the, on the old TV... When you used to watch the 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 uh, the, the fireplace, they, they would put it up the on the Yule log. Right? The Yule log. The Yule log. That's what it's. A log, the Omer log instead of the Yule log. log. That's right. There you go. <laughs> I, I, 
Coincidence? Both parks, both I don't think so. Oral Park's on fire this year, by the way. People tell me it is going to be All a right. Thing. You know, let's not make too many jokes about that if, if you were listening to the... Uh, I wasn't. To the, uh, it's okay. Movie. It's it's fine. I actually didn't know we had bonfires. Like, it's, it's just like that thing they do in England. Uh, Whatever. They do a lot of things in England. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, so we have the whole uh, calendar um, that goes through the three um, pilgrimage festivals. Um and then there's a little break, a little a little pause that sort of summarizes it, and then we go back and focus on Shabbat on uh, Sukkot, uh, and expand a little bit more on the celebration of Sukkot. Um, and uh, then at the end, chapter 24, we have like a couple of little paragraphs that. Uh, um, uh, are involved with uh, some temple offerings, the oil and the and the uh, the the, uh, the bread, the uh, um, the twelve shoe breads that they were that word was uh, um, invented by Ed Sullivan. Um, so uh, they they, they um, that are there, you know, from week to week in the temple. That, that, so those are temple elements within the temple service. And then finally, we have this very, very provocative story that in a certain sense brings us back to the idea of Chilul Hashem, of desecrating God's name, and actually literally, um, that's the story. And we've mentioned before that the book of Leviticus is, has very, very few narrative pieces, very, very few stories. Um, and basically, the stories are always terrible. <laughs> So, uh, you know, we have the story of, of Aaron's sons dying. Um, and we have this story, which is, uh, you know, a, a story about, a, you know, a fight uh, between uh, two people. And, and uh, one of them gets so worked up. Um, Merle, are you still there? You know, when she says, when I get angry, I get angry. All the things that have been making me angry, they all, they all come together. So there's a certain kind of uh, um, outburst that, that one of the people in the fight um, is overcome with, and he uh, curses God, and then we have uh, um, nobody knows what to do, and in the end, he he's uh, executed, and we have the last part of the Torah tells us the famous uh, statement about it, an eye for an eye that uh, we had already in the Book of Exodus, and uh, here it is again. So that's the Torah reading. Um, so it's got these, like I like I said, it's got a little bit of a, a little bit of. It's got a lot of uh, priestly stuff, temple stuff, and then it's got this whole um, Jewish calendar stuff, and then it's got that story stuff. So anybody have a particular place they want to land today? All right. That's that sounds like a, a reasonable suggestion. Um, so uh, we'll just be quiet for a while, and uh, we'll make believe we're like Quakers or something like that. So we, nobody will say anything until until the spirit moves us. How's that, Jen? Um, so if I do this, I'm forcing myself to read, but okay. So <laughs> that's why nobody, that's why nobody, that's wants, why nobody to wants to talk. They're terrorized by the idea that they would actually didn't have to read the text that loud. So, I, I'm not looking at this and I haven't, this week has been not a, you know, great week, but I just like hearing your recap. I'm like, I, do we have a kind of principle that what you, when you sin against God, it's between you and God more than. Like, it, like the idea of like, I guess it um, is it because it's public because I know whatever you do in your home in the end, at the end of the day, if you're not public about it, it's between you and God. And it's just like, was this a public thing where so now he's encouraging other people to sin against God? I don't even we've we've, we've I mean, look, we've talked we've actually examined this story once or twice over the years. Um, and it, it's a pretty, uh, you know, in terms of how the tradition has, has expanded upon it, it's, it's a very interesting and very disturbing story. But it's not actually out of bounds from the, the rest of the approach of the Torah, which is a little bit maybe uncomfortable for us, which is that no religion is not your own private, your business. 
you know, your religious behavior is society's business. And if we know about it, um, society is charged to do something about it and to punish the sinners. And uh, when we don't know anything about it, God says, I'll, I'll get you. Okay. So, uh, so um, later, is there a, a later, later. What? Uh, I guess I was, maybe it's later when Moshe is like, not, we're not going house to house to hunt for idols. Or is so that what? Well, you know? we don't go house to house to hunt for idols, but if somebody reports that somebody is uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, promote idol worship, we go in there, you know, with guns blazing. So um, obviously, the, yes, there have to be witnesses. There has to be a report. But once it becomes public knowledge, um, it's it's uh, the the public's business to um, destroy, burn out evil from their midst. And uh, and then God says, and if you don't know about it, I know about it. And and people take curses upon their on their on their heads for doing things in private that nobody else will know about, but if it's wrong, God will, God will visit punishment upon them. Where we have a little bit of a, of a, of a distinction between what's God's is God's and what's you know, human is human, to paraphrase a statement from some other tradition, um, is when we get to post you know, uh, uh, temple times, when we talk about what Yom Kippur can do and what Yom Kippur can't do. Right. So uh, and then we say that Yom Kippur can bring atonement for a person who seeks uh, atonement um, for sins that they do against God directly. But if you do a sin against a human being, then Yom Kippur is not going to wash away your sin unless you try to make the uh, you make good the harm that you did to that other human being, emotional, financial, physical whatever it is, you have to try to, you know, repair the damage with the other human being. So that Yom Kippur is powerless to, to expunge. But a sin that you did just to God, that Yom Kippur, that, that's between you and God. Right? But even there, it's, you know, and, and it's interesting. I mean, I'm not, we're not going to look at it today. Um, but how powerful Yom Kippur is, is a matter of discussion. Um, you know, can it can it uh, um, can it bring atonement for people who are not sorry? You know, so that's another discussion, and it's obviously a, a, a theological, religious, speculative thing. Um, and then it's also our own moral questions. You know, what's fair, and what do we what do we hope for? What do we think is right? Um, again, coming back to your schmooze. Um, if we don't know what somebody did right or wrong, so it, it sits a little uneasy with us. And then how much do we feel that, you know, justice will be done? And what good is justice being done when somebody, you know, when it's too late? So, and is that justice also? You know, so those are, those are heavy questions. They're not quite, you know, in this Torah reading. Um, of course, again, on one foot, you know, what we did do is we, we took away the literal reading of an eye for an eye, right? We said, here it is, black on white, Torah couldn't be more clear, it says it like five times, um, and guess what? We're convinced that it cannot mean that. The Torah absolutely can't mean that we're going to gouge out people's eyes, you know, uh, as, as a punishment, but not, and, and, uh, you know, even uh, even in terms of a, a life for a life, gets much much more complicated. Um, you know, so we're we're convinced that that can't be what what's right. Um, but the but the message is very strong, because the question is very strong. You know, it's a very hard problem for people to have to deal with. Um, yeah. In the case of that story, you know what? We'll read that story. I'm sort of like avoiding reading it, but you know, why? Since you volunteered so graciously, Jen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can somebody give me the page? Seven thirty-two. Okay. And it's chapter twenty-four in Leviticus, verse ten. Okay. 
There came out among the Israelites one whose mother was Israelite and whose father was Egyptian. And a fight broke out in the camp between the half Israelite and a certain Israelite. The son of the Israelite woman pronounced the name in blasphemy, and he was brought to Moses. Now his mother's name was Shalomit, right, Shlomit. Shlomit, daughter of Debri of the tribe of Dan, and he was placed in custody until the decision of the Lord should be made clear to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the blasphemer outside the camp, and let all who were within hearing lay their hands upon his head, and let the whole community stone him. And to the Israelite people speak thus, Anyone who blasphemies his God shall bear his guilt. If he also pronounces the name Hashem, he shall be put to death. And the whole community shall stone him, stranger or citizen. If he has thus pronounced the name, he shall be put to death. Yeah, and let's continue. Let's just get the rest of it. If anyone kills any human being, he shall be put to death. One who kills a beast shall make restitution for it, life for life. If anyone maims his fellow as he has done, so shall it be done to him, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The injury he inflicted on another shall be inflicted on him. One who kills a beast shall make restitution for it, but one who kills a human shall be put to death. You shall have one standard for stranger and citizen alike, for I, am the, for I the Lord, am your God. Moses spoke thus to the Israelites, and they took the blasphemer outside the camp and pelted him with stones. The Israelites did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Right. So uh, there it is. We end on an upbeat note. Um, all right. So the, the story itself, um, what do we know happened? Um... I don't know why we call him a half Israelite, because wouldn't you be a full Israelite by virtue of your mom, or that's not really here yet. Uh, but the somebody who had an Egyptian dad and a um, Hebrew mom had a fight with a, a full Israelite, um, the, who's not named, it seems. And the, the son, the, I guess they're talking about the half Israelite, uh, pronounced blasphemous, blasphemously used the name of God. Right. And then there's a judgment. Right. So, so full and half is not in the text. That's your, you know, way of, of summarizing it. But there is. It does say half Israelite. It, tells him. it says half Israelite. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's in the real text in Hebrew, but it's, it's, not, in, it's, no, it's not in. No, it's not in the real text. No, sorry. Um, where does it say half Israelite? Uh, and a fight broke out in camp between that half Israelite and a certain Israelite. Right, right. So that's not in the text. Um, that's how are we going to read this when you're when you retire? How are we actually going to know those of us who don't speak Hebrew? What? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my personal email and contact information. <laughs> here, and and uh, you know, call me up. We and will. You no. Know, uh, so. Yeah. All right, so the you know, I would suggest get other translations, right? Get Maybe a few other translations. The classes that you said you want to teach. Well, so I mean, we you know, I've talked about the fact that that there are other approaches to translating the biblical text. The 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 well known uh, you know uh, uh, one is. Um, I'm doing that. I can't know if you see it. I'm going with a John Alter. Robert Alter. That's Robert Alter. Robert. But let's see. Let's see what he says. Um, the one that came before him, but it's been sort of overshadowed by Robert Alter, is uh, by um, what's his name? I uh, I have it on the shelf there. Fox. Right. Thank you, Everett Fox. Everett Fox. Yeah. Right. So he tries to be much more literal, so to speak, of, about the about the biblical text, and then Robert Elliot Friedman uh, translated his his translation really hasn't. His commentary is excellent. His translation has really not gotten any notice whatsoever, as far as I can tell. Um, he's not counted as one of the important translators these days, but he, you know, his commentary is excellent. Um, and Alter, uh, you know, did the major work that, you know, uh, it's um, unbelievable. He did the whole Tanakh. Um, 
So do you have it? What does Rabbi yes. Hoffa say? And the son of an Israelite woman, he being the son of an Egyptian man, went out among the Israelites, and the son of the Israelite woman and an Israelite man brawled in the camp. And the son of the Israelite woman invoked the name, vilifying it. And they brought him to Moses. And his mother's name was Shlomit, daughter mm -hmm. of Zebri of the tribe of Dan. And they left him under guard until it should be made clear to them by the word of the Lord. Okay, so in my opinion, that's a much, much better translation. Um, this is what we're all buying next. <laughs> so there. Yeah, so it gives you, you know, it gives you accurately what the phrases are saying in the Hebrew. And it, it sort of leaves the enigmatic qualities a little more um, to sit there. Um, and I asked, you know, what, what exactly happened? What do we know happened? The answer is we don't know anything. We really don't know much at all. Um, because if you're talking about the fighting, what was the fight exactly? Did they, did they actually get into fisticuffs? Did they hurt each other? Um, was it just a bunch of yelling at each other? Does it lead us to believe that, I don't know, maybe he was being picked on because he was half Egyptian? Well, so then again, and then the, these ways of referring to these two people calls attention, uh, call attention, you know, we're, we're, we're noticing it. And the translation that we have in our Eitz Chaim tries to then interpret what's going on. But clearly the Torah is distinguishing between the son of an Israelite woman, Ben Hayisraelit, right, and Ish Hayisraeli, and the Israelite man, right? And that's, of course, the, you know, a le you know, legitimate uh, inference to make that, oh, and an Israelite man is, you know, an Israelite man. But a son of an Israelite woman must not quite be an Israelite man. There must be some kind of difference. Um, your question about uh, um, matrilineal descent, we've talked about it other places. Yes, I'm sorry, I remember now. Right. In, the, in the Torah, it's patrilineal descent that determines everything. And specifically, it's not just your Israelite I, uh, um, identity, but your Israelite identity is also a tribal identity. So that's part of the problem here, right? The, the, the inference that we make is this person has had an Israelite mother, but what tribe does this person belong to? His mother belonged to the tribe of Dan, but his father was an Egyptian. If his father had been a Danite, he would be from the tribe of Dan. If his father was from the tribe of uh, Levi, he would be a Levite or maybe even a Kohen. But his father wasn't Jewish. His father wasn't of any of the tribes. So it's not just, I mean, it's not Jewish in the contemporary term. He's not part of any identifiable segment of the Jewish people from his father's side. And that's what determines his identity. So he's in this very liminal, weird place um, and that's how that's 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 what's said about him. Um, it's a little mysterious. Why aren't we told his name? Why aren't we told the other guy's name? And why are we told the mother's name? You know why why don't we just say, you know, um, two people fought and one of them you know you know uh, um, cursed God. What does God say later on? This law applies to any citizen or any alien. It applies to anybody. So what do we care what his pedigree was? Well, mentioning the name of the mother and not mentioning the name of the other, the people who fought, the two guys who fought, to me, it seems like it's like pointing a finger at her, like this is her fault. So, mm -hmm. There's, there's, there's a, a um, yeah, there's a question here. What do you mean a, an Egyptian father? How did that happen? Well, you know, we don't, we don't have to be really, really super imaginative to think of scenarios where this woman became impregnated by an Egyptian and it was not at all her fault. I mean, it, we could also imagine, yes, she was intimate with the enemy. 
right? But th let's think about this. This was, um, we're talking about, you know, people who are uh, old enough to know better, so to speak. You know, there's, we're not talking about bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, that doesn't you know, exist right now, but we're not talking about a three-year-old. We're talking about people that are, um, you know, big enough to get themselves into some serious trouble here and then be held accountable. That means that this, these people were all born in Egypt. All of these people lived for years. They, when they were born and they were raised in Egypt as slaves. So this Israelite woman, you know, was she to be stigmatized as, you know, somebody who crossed the line? She, you know, she, she, uh, you know, did, you know, the unmentionable, um, or was she a victim herself? And this, and this kid is, you know, growing up um, with a single mom, or obviously, you know, in the mom's, maybe in the mom's family, but known, it's known, everybody knows she never got married. And we don't know that she had any, uh, an affair with another Israelite guy that doesn't own up to it. Somehow we know that she had um, relations with some Egyptian guy. It's known. This is public property. Everybody knows this is public information. Everybody knows that this is what this guy is. So the, the element of stigma certainly seems to be, you know, pretty clear. And, you know, I would just say also, even if she was a victim, we blame the victim every day the way we go around things. So, you know, so, and, you know, and especially women. So uh, the fact that, that uh, um, she's being singled out could be very much in terms of a stigma. I don't know if that's the only way to read it though. Yeah, Sarita. I know, I was just, you know, it makes me think of, um, you know, like the, the girls who were kidnapped by Boko Haram um, and they come back, you know, um, you know, while they were missing, <laughs> you know, oh, we want them back, we want them back, they come back and they were impregnated, they, you know, and they're totally ostracized. Right. And their right. children are not accepted. They're, they're right. viewed as traitors, yeah. And, and what is that, what, what is that, you know, it, it's sadly, I mean, you're, it's such a phenomenon, it's such a common phenomenon. It's this terrible way that we scapegoat people because they remind us of our shame or they remind us of our own powerlessness. You know, let's say this one, this woman, this, this in the, in the biblical text, let's say she was one of these people who was, you know, uh, uh, abused by an Egyptian. Um, and we know it. What do we, what do we also know about ourselves when we know that about her? That we had no power. That we didn't stop it. No. We didn't do anything about it. And if we could, we didn't. And if we couldn't, then we know that we were powerless. We know that we were totally, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, defeated in any sense of, of protecting our own, of standing up for ourselves. And that's a humiliating thought. Well, guess what? We can't blame the Egyptian guy anymore, but she is living and her son is, is a living reminder of our own humiliation. So maybe that's what's going on here. Um, you know, that's, 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 there's a, there's a, there's a, a very, you know, what can I say? There's, there's, it's a very terse report of the story, but it gives us these very, very clear shards of information, all of which are distressing. So that the underlying backstory of what gets reported here is very sad and very troubling. Um, and, and it has a lot of tragedy, no matter how you look at it, no matter how you look at it. Um, the sages saw this kind of stuff and that's what they speculate was part of the fight. Right. What were they fighting about? So if we now think about all the stigmatization and guilty conscience and, and getting angry at people because, 
you're really angry about something else and, and, and all of these different factors that, that we've been throwing in, um, it might you know, not be such a big leap to imagine you know, the Ben Yisraeli, the full quote unquote, as, as, you know, as we said before, you know, you know, you know, maybe uh, taunting um, the, uh, this other guy um, and pushing and pushing until the other guy uh, strikes back. The rabbis had an even more upsetting uh, possibility, which is, uh, I mean, it's heartbreaking telling them that's what do you call those a, 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 a trigger warning. Um, they imagined that this uh, son of an Israelite woman was coming to the authorities and saying, where do I fit? Who am I? According to your system, I'm a no one. Where should I live? Can I live in a tent next to my mother's tent? Can I live in the tribe of Dan? Everybody's been assigned, you know, their their local, uh, um, you know, precincts, you know, in in the encampment. So they imagine him saying, "Hello, what about me?" And the decision of the court, the rabbis explain, say to him. You don't belong. You're not a Danite because it's your mother who's the Danite and your dad is an Egyptian. You don't belong to the tribe of Dan. Well, so where am I supposed to go? What's the answer? Where could you go? Out of the camp, right? Out of the camp, when we think about out of the camp, we don't always think enough about the fact that out of the camp was actually a place. When we send out the leper, quote unquote, that's the Mitzora, right? Um, or anybody that's, that's really, really ritually impure that has to go out of the camp. So what do they do? They start like walking around in the middle of the desert and they just go someplace, you know, and, and, and then the, the lions and the hyenas go and eat them up. No, it, they, they, they go outside the town line. So they're not in the camp, but guess what? There were plenty of people out there that were not part of the camp. How many people left Egypt along with the Israelites and were sort of like moving along, you know, with the, the, uh, the Israelite encampment, the Erev Rav, right? That the Torah tells us when we left Egypt, a whole bunch of other people, the doors were open. Anybody that had the initiative just ran out with us. So according to this rabbinic reconstruction of the scenario, us good guys, us you know, religious authorities are kicking him out. And that's the fight. And he's saying, you, what are you talking about? My mother is right here. She's sitting right here. You can't, you're kicking me out? And that's when he curses God. And that's when he curses God. I mean, the, the audacity of that uh, you know, uh, imagining is that it really is putting the, the system itself in a terrible light. You know, if anything, the one good guy here, the one person who we should have a little Rachmanis for, the one person we should have some feeling for is this Ben Ha'isha Yisraeli, the son of the Israelite mother. And you know what her name was? Her name was Shlomit, Shlomit, right? The peaceful one, the one of peace, right? Bat Divri, the daughter of my words, right? So then, you know, we might think about these two people, they're not mentioned, you know, the names have been not just changed, but expunged to protect the innocent or to protect, or because of the shame. We don't want to know who made this terrible decision. And we, wanted, we don't want to know who's, who has done this terrible injustice um, or was brought to the point of 
losing it and cursing God. And, but her mother, but his mother is, you know, when we make a Misha Beira for somebody who's sick, we mention the mother. You know, this is a child of a mother. So there's a, there's a real kind of, um, I think there's enough material in the, 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 the strange kind of edited uh, narration that we have, there's enough material to make us really shake our heads and feel very, very distressed. And nobody knows what to do now, right? Nobody knows what's right. So you could just do it in a very strict halachic way. One second, Sarita, you know, well, of course they don't know because the Torah hasn't said anything yet. So, so, but you know, maybe it's more than that, right? Maybe it's really, you know, this kind of sense of bewilderment that nobody here comes off good. Nobody here is a tzaddik. And the, the tragic, you know, uh, point, uh, you know, is, is reached for this person. So reader, what do you want to say? So then you look at the sort of the, the punchline. <laughs> you shall have one standard for stranger and citizen alike. So one is one that's a terrible thing. You're going to treat everyone the same. You're not going to think about contextual, you know, context or anything. But then is that really treating everyone the same? Um, you know, so, um, you know, that, 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 that very simple sentence that sounds like a wonderful statement about equality um, just isn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I would not say it just isn't because actually in a certain way, paradoxically, it is. But it's so problematic. It's so mm -hmm. fraught with contradictions here. Um, you know, like you say, it, and it, I mean, it's, if, let's put it this way, he curses God. So if he curses God, he gets the death penalty. Because anybody who curses God gets the death penalty. So we're applying the same law, right? Despite the fact that he's not a full Israelite, nobody has the right to curse God, right? Certainly not in public. This is what, you know, apparently a public offense. This is a chilul Hashem. And this is expected of everybody to control themselves, no matter how badly they feel. Um, but on the other hand, the reason that the guy cursed God, according to this rabbinic way, they're reading the entire text and they make it into this kind of terrible, paradoxical, sad situation is because he wasn't treated the same as, as everybody else, right? So is it, you know, is this, this kind of like really painful statement that on the one hand, he's not gonna get away with it, but what's gonna to happen to the next person? What would happen to the next person? And you think he's the only person that didn't have a Jewish quote unquote, uh, Jewish father? The Egyptians, you know, were very gallant about, about all the Israelite women that were uh, slaves in Egypt. Um, is this a kind of now a, 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 a you know, repair or a retraction? Yeah, Alan, you wanted to say something? No, I'm just struck by um, the method he's put to death. Um, and, and, and not, you know, so the whole community comes, but the people that were within earshot, um, they put their hands on him. They all need to put their hands on his head well, the uh, so first of all, there's kind of a weirdness that you're putting yourself in harm's way that people are throwing rocks, but no, 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 they put their hands on his head before. before. But it's as if they're taking some for there. There's an I don't know if there's an accountability, a responsibility, a connection to this individual where it's not like it, he went away to jail. You never have to see him again. Don't worry about it. We took care of it. But they were kind of active in the outcome. Right. Uh, so, so what you're pointing works. out, what you're pointing out, of course, is an is an action that everybody that brings a sacrifice does. When I dis, when I bring a sacrifice to the to the sanctuary to the temple, I put my hand on the animal's head. So I thought that that's part of what you were saying. That's that's what's happening here. This person is a a national sacrifice. Hmm. Um. I wanna, I wanna just for a half a second. Let 
look at verse at look at page three uh well 323 which is exodus if you've got it exodus chapter 2 verse 11 just to get the background the real verse that we have to look at is, is a couple of verses in but exodus chapter 2 verse 11 jen you got it it's on 323 in the Eitz Chaim. But any edition you got, you can look at Alter if you want. Go to Alter. You know what? Do us a favor. The rest of us may have the JPS, but let's let's have a nice uh, uh, treat of a, of a comparative translation. You got it? Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. But we can't hear you. You're on mute. My bad. Sorry. And it happened at that time. You know what the biblical punishment is for not putting, uh, not unmuting when you're supposed to? I don't want to know. <laughs> it's bad. Go ahead. And it happened at that time that Moses grew up and went out to his brothers and saw their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his brothers. And he turned this way and that and saw that there was no man about. And he struck down the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Right, so this is a famous uh, story, right? And now, verse 13. Uh, and he went out the next day, and look, two Hebrew men were brawling. And he said to the one in the wrong, why should you strike your fellow? Okay, let's stop right there. Go back now to Leviticus 24, verse 10. Okay. I should have held the place. I'm sorry. Verse 10. Yeah. It is. You know what the biblical punishment is? for not <laughs> <laughs> And the son of an Israelite woman, he being the son of an Egyptian man, went out among the Israelites. And the son of the Israelite woman and an Israelite man brawled in the camp. And the son... Yashakoach, Robert Alter. The word that's in both places is brawling. Right? So in Vayikra, it's Vayinatsu Bamachane Ben Ayisraelit Ve'ish Ayisraelit. If you look at uh, Shemot Exodus 13, he went out on the second day, Anashim Ivrim, right? And this is before we have Yisraelim, so to speak. They're Ivrim, they're Hebrew, but they're both an Ish Ivri and another Ish Ivri, as opposed to one Ish Ivri and one Ben Isha Ivrit or something like that, right? Two Anashim Ivrim, Nitzim. Alter actually has a footnote on that, that it's the same. Oh, he says it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. So um, so there you have it. So, so there's a similar, I mean, there's the echo of the word. Believe me, the word is not used 50,000 times in the Torah. Um, there, there's a, 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 an echo that's meant to, to ring those bells between those two stories and what happened and this of course is famous um, it's one of the, the great qualities of Moses what happened in the Exodus story um. Moses intervenes Moses gets in between the two brawlers and says hey cut it out what are you doing he tries to stop the fight. Now come back over to here. You know, and obviously, what didn't happen? Nobody got in the middle. Nobody tried to stop the fight. Nobody tried to stop the fight. So that's another layer of tragedy that's going on here. Right? There's, this, there's so much human mess that's going on. Um, but then the Torah draws a line, right? And it says, yeah, but don't curse God. Curse, curse the other person. Curse the other person or knock his teeth out. Obviously, then you'll have to pay for it. But, you know, if, if, if uh, you know, if you, if that's what you are, what, what you're involved in and where, what about everybody else? Everybody else going back to, to Alan, what your point was, Right. Look at how the divide, look at the, the direct involvement 
all of the hands that they didn't put out to try to pull these two people apart, now they have to put their hands on this victim's head and and they're going to kill him. They're going to kill him because because they killed him, because they brought him to this situation where he brought you know God's God's displeasure, God's God's uh, ire uh, upon him. So on the one hand, he's responsible, but we're all responsible in that way of looking at the story. So a very very complicated kind of uh, uh, back and forth, and uh, that you know one law, one law for everybody. You know, so what Sarita is pointing out. Look at how bitter that tastes in the mouth when you say it. It's supposed to be a glorious principle of fairness, of inclusion, right? But uh, in this particular case, um, you know, it's 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 uh, something that that maybe not so easy to go to sleep after about. You know, if you're involved. Anybody else want to say anything about this? So uh, the whole, the whole, uh, this whole session was a little dark. Uh, what can I say? Very interesting, okay. though. You wanted to end five minutes early. You know what? We'll end right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. There's a minion. Okay. Shkawach to everybody. Next time, I hope. Okay. Bye. Bye.